Morning, everyone. As part of SSR Bytes Lecture, this lecture is on dual energy CT for the beginners and SK applications. I'm Abhish Shabra from UT Southwestern Dallas, Texas. And over the next 10 minutes, we'll discuss DECT. These are my disclosures. I have no conflict of interest. Uh, so we'll explain conventional CT technique for bone and soft tissue reconstructions. We'll discuss available DECT techniques and finally illustrate the DECT role in MSK applications. As part of conventional CT, as you do routinely, you scan at thin collimations. IV contrast is only used for tumors or infections. And generally, it's good to break up the field of view between upper part of the extremity versus lower part so that there's not a lot of blank space around the extremity when you reconstruct. And finally, people reconstruct at two to three millimeter in bone algorithm, which is high frequency and three to four millimeters in soft tissue kernels in all three planes. Now these planes are oriented along the anatomy, not the anatomy of the body, but the anatomy of the structures. For example, for the knees, it will be between medial and lateral epicondyles versus for ankles, it's between medial and lateral medulli. And finally, the 3D volume rendered maps are also created. So here's a scan showing the soft tissue window and the bone window and bone window is high frequency algorithm. Now these volume rendered images provide a holistic view of the pelvis. In this case shows a transitional vertebra with these prominent mammary processes of the sacrum. It also shows excessive overlap of the coccyx to the pubic symphysis, which means posterior pelvic tilt. Then these bones are segmented into acetabulum and femur to look at the normal head and neck offset and the normal shape of the acetabulum. Also a cutout view is created to see if there is excessive under coverage or over coverage of the femoral head compared to the acetabulum. Now these conventional CTs highlight these differences very well when these volume rendered images are created. Here you can see the femoral head and neck bumps. You can see the posterior pelvic tilt with very little gap between the pubic symphysis and coccyx. Normally it's two centimeters, 2.3 in males and 4.6 in females. Here there is excessive um, uh, gap, which means there's anterior pelvic tilt. And this is a dysplastic hip with more shallow acetabulum and also sort of chopped off femoral heads because of the gluteus minimus impressions. Now, the dual energy CT also gives you all of the stuff we talked about, the volume rendered images, the reconstructions, etc. But it also plays on these physics concepts. These tissues and materials can be characterized by their differential X-ray attenuation. So there are two energies here. So typically 80 and 140 kVp or 100 and 140 kVp. And these tissues and materials, they attenuate based on the photo energy used, the density of the material and atomic number. And there are two types of interactions which are happening, photoelectric effects and Compton scattering. <clears throat> now these different tissues appear different. For example, if you look at iodine versus bone, when you move in this lower energy spectrum, this is the KEV, which is mono energy is created from the dual energies we scanned at. We scanned at 100 and 140, and then these are broken down into different KEVs, mono energies, more pure energies. So here you can see there's more increase in attenuation or differences in attenuation between the iodine at two different energy levels versus less increase for the bones. Now, when you plot these energies, so here's 80 kV and this is 140 kV, you can see the different tissues and different molecules and atoms from the NIST table, they lie at different places along this curve. So they can be separated out. So for example, we have the soft tissue windows from two different energies here. So there is 80, this is 140, and you can see the calcium appears better at 80. Now there are different ways of acquiring it based on the vendor you have it at your place. It could be two sources, it could be a single source, with rapid KVP switching. It could be a detector base where the detector itself separates the two beams, or it could be a twin beam CT with two beams coming from a single source. Uh, because of dual energy CT, we can see other, other things, not just what we saw with the single energy CT. You can see bone marrow maps, gout maps. You can look at only iodine, for example, for arthrograms or perfusion scans with injections or non-iodine maps, so for 3D reconstructions of arthrograms to remove the iodine and create the bone reconstructions like the volume rendered images I showed you, or you can reduce the metal artifacts. So let's look at some examples. So bone marrow maps are similar to MRI. They show this bone edema as green colors. 
on a translucent blue 3D map, which can be rotated. So how does it help? Well, first of all, you see the normal bones have blue structure. These greens at the edges are because of attenuation, these are artifacts. So now we know this is the area of real edema. So if you go back here, that's where the fracture is. So it helps you find the fractures, increase the confidence level, and also find fractures quickly. And then if you had the whole extremity, you're imaging and trying to find that non-displaced fracture on your call. Now, the fractures can be subtle. Here we have sutures from previous injury. And if you look at this, nothing shows up much. If you look at the bone marrow map, there's edema of the lateral condyle of the femur, as well as across the proximal tibiofibular joint. Now, if you look carefully, there's trabecular distortion of the femur. That's where the tiny air pocket is also. So you know that this is where the injury is. Now, you can also see these non-displaced fractures in the periphery of the film. So this was actually missed because it was a non-displaced veritocantric fracture, but that's where the edema is. Now, ignore these artifacts at the edges because at the edges, you'll get some artifacts. For smaller bones like carpus and tarsus, if they have a non-displaced fracture, they're harder to pick out, especially if they image from pelvis all the way to the toes. This was missed on call, but you can see there's edema right in the midfoot. And just like bone contusion and MR, these small bones, all of them show edema with most edema at the area of the fracture. Not only fractures, you can also see other pathologies. So in this case, there's a charcoal foot, the charcoal ankle, a lot of destruction of the bone with debris and effusion, and all of the bones showing edema. There's a lot of reactive edema happening around the ankle and the hind foot. You can also see the tendon tears with tenosynovitis. What about osteomyelitis? Well, here we have a big abscess there a lot of soft tissue process. So they want to rule out if there's bone involvement. Obviously there's no cortical destruction, which will um, help in finding or not finding osteomyelitis. So in this case, there's no bone marrow edema also. So you're pretty much 100% sure that there's no osteomyelitis. So we use a lot of these scans in patients who cannot get MRIs, so blue energy helps. <clears throat> Now in younger patients, when you see effusion, you always think of radial head fracture, lateral condylar fracture. In this case, there's no fractures, there's a big effusion. But you can see there's bone marrow edema. So what is that due to? Is that effusion? Well, that's all synovitis causing the active edema, in this case from rheumatoid arthritis. There are pitfalls, however. For example, here you have bone fractures, but no edema. Why is that so? Well, you got a cast there. So if you have a cast around the extremity that attenuates the beam and make it similar to single energy, and you're not going to see that edema. Not only fractures, you can also see other lesions. For example, in this case, there's subtle lesion in the humerus. That's where there's this purple color and there's edema around it. So that tells you this is an aggressive lesion and that's what you expect in lesions like metastasis, which thin the cortex or myeloma and there'll be edema around it. And this edema is very similar to what you're gonna see on MRI. There's a big synovial sarcoma of the foot, there's destruction of the bone, there's bone marrow edema on MRI, and there's also bone marrow edema on the CT. So in naviculum cuneiform at the base of the mesh tarsal, which is eroded by that mass lesion. Sometimes you get unusual cases. This came from the ER, the CT looks totally normal. There's some soft tissue edema there. You look at on the gout map, there's no gout, but there's this great velocity cyst. You look at the bone marrow map and there's a lot of edema there. And this was leukemia. So the only way to find that was from this dual energy CT or you do an MRI. Now you can also do crystal mapping. So here there's no crystal. This is normal bones, tendon, zero um, is the value which is shown here versus in this case, you have all these gouty tophi, they appear green. Now nail polish can also appear green. Tattoos can also appear green because this is based on density. But if they're periarticular, they're punctate or confluent around the tendon joints, then you know it's gout. And they can be present even with normal or lower uric acid levels. So this is sort of a new reference standard now. And here you can get the volume also is seven centimeter cube of gouty tophi. Now these appear dense on CT. So it's hard to differentiate from calcium. But these are all the gouty tophi which happen in pericruciate areas or under the popliteus tendon or MCL. Now they can be mixed in. So in this case, you have chondrocalcinosis or TFCC, but there's also gouty tophi in the dorsal wrist. So you can have mixed crystal disease. Finally, for metal artifact reduction, the problems are due to the metal hitting uh, the, uh, the X-ray beam, there's photon starvation as well as beam hardening. So you get white and dark streaks around the metal. An artifact is most pronounced near the most metal. 
or the stronger metal, for example, cobalt, chromium, steel, revision arthroplasty, they create a lot of artifacts. The intramedullary nails are the least artifacts you can see here, there's not much artifact. So what can you do if you're a single energy CT, you can use adequate photons, scan at 140 or above, uh, acquire thin, reconstruct thick. So reconstruct in four to five millimeter slices, use wider windows with softer kernels, employ metal reduction software if you have it, and finally use dual energy CT and evaluate at higher mono energy. So if you scanned at say 120 or 140, you evaluate at 145 to 155 kilo electron volts. So usually around 150 or so you get good images. So now you can see the metal, you can see the bone around it, you can see the soft tissue mass, maybe there is a lucency there. Well, if you look at MRI, yes. There's all this particle disease, there's also bone involvement. And you can also evaluate the plate rotation, the tibial tray rotations. In this case, you take a 90 of the tibial tray, another line between medial one third and lateral two thirds of the tibial tuberosity, take an angle between those two lines, it's about three degrees, shouldn't be more than 10 degrees or so. So to summarize, you can do much more on dual energy CT than single energy CT for MSK. These are some suggested readings. Don't forget to check out the SSR Education Club check out the interactive lectures and bites on SSR YouTube channel. Uh, thank you for your attention and have a great day.